Hello, and welcome to another episode of Two Average Joes. Um, I'm Joe St. John, and for many of you who have followed us over the few, past few months, you know that I have about 30 years of law enforcement experience, and I have been involved in all different facets of law enforcement. And so this has been a very interesting, interesting topic for me as we get ready to wrap up the trial of John Norman Collins. And my partner, as usual, is Mr. Robert Baker. And Robert, give us a little bit about yourself. Robert Baker. I'm a practicing attorney in Michigan, um, Southwest Michigan, but I, I practice all over the state. I do criminal defense and civil litigation, uh, small town lawyers. So I do a lot of small town lawyer stuff, but I get seem to get some high profile cases. And we're here after the long journey of this is our 22nd episode on the, what we call, what they was called Michigan murders or co-ed killings that occurred from 1967 to 1969. And John Norman Collins, if you remember our last episode, that there, his trial has just started. All right. So opening statements were made and uh, what has occurred, what occurs is the first three days the the uh, prosecution goes through um, the disappearance of, of Karen Sue Bynum and, and um, the scientific evidence of her death and um, the autopsy and all that other stuff. And we've talked about that already, so I'm not going to go back into that, but that's the first three days. Um, Larry Mathewson, who we're going to have probably the next episode. Yes an interview that I had at my law office uh, probably seven or eight years ago. Uh, I talked to him for, I don't know, hour and a half, two hours. I had some (laughs) technical problems because I had bought a brand new video camera and I wasn't up to snuff on it, but I got some good stuff on it. And you will see that next week, next week. And um, he had testified that he had seen John McCollins around town and it seemed like everybody in the dog saw him. He didn't hide it. And, uh, Yes, he was on his motorcycle, so he was not yeah. But before I get way deep into the testimony, I want you to remember, and I don't know whether I mentioned this as far as the voir dire went, but there was a woman who said, they asked, hey, do you think John Norman Collins is guilty? And he said, yes, I do. And they said, why do you think that? Because the killing stopped, okay? And that's one of the defense attorney's biggest hurdles is, is that that tainted the whole jury pool, all right? So that's in the back of somebody's mind, like a rock in a shoe, the jury members and, and the, and the, the uh, defense has to overcome that, even though, and we said that you are guilty in America until proven innocent, you're supposed to be the opposite of that. But just remember, as we go through the different aspects of the witnesses and the evidence that's presented, that that is what has to be overcome, even though you're not supposed to have to overcome that. That is actually the way it goes down in America. It did in 69 or 70 when this trial was. It is in 2022. <laughs> so yeah. that's just our public service. That's a, that's a nice thought that you're in. <laughs> right. So um, the... The first thing that they started after they went through all of that was pointing out what the motorcycle was and his ownership of that motorcycle. Okay. Well, ownership is a kind of a relative term because he stole most of his motorcycles. Ownership is a, yeah. (laughs) So He was in possession of it. I will give him that. He was, he was. And the motorcycle actually that he rode off with Karen Sue Bynum and evidently was owned by a frat brother. And if you remember, you can go back to all our other episodes about the fraternity and its potential involvement in these killings. But so uh, this motorcycle evidently eventually gets returned after this trial to the, one of his frat brothers that it was stolen from, <clears throat> but he liked to shift parts around on it. Okay. And what I did not know was um, that John Norman Collins um, came back to his house on Emmett Street at four o'clock, supposedly. So Arnold Davis and um, Andrew Emanuel, if you remember these two characters. Yes, he's they're in every there. episode. He's been, they've been threaded through there. They meet and go to, lunch, to dinner, but he comes back at four o'clock and they both see him at four o'clock. 
that's what their testimony was in John Norman Collins's trial. Right. Andrew Manuel, who didn't say a whole lot, but he did say that. Mm-hmm. And, and um, Arnold Davis said the same thing. All right. So, and I'll get to that in a second, but just keep that in, that in mind that um, the prosecution is putting on its case. Okay. It's first witnesses. You know, I said what they were. Larry Matheson testifies. They, they identify the motorcycle first and he's switching parts. And there was a big thing, big deal about this rectangular uh, mirror that was on this motorcycle that he, that he carted off Ms. Karen Sue Bynum and on and conflicting testimony on that, but it was a bright blue motorcycle. That was a, a, a triumph um, though. There was conflicting testimony on that. The, and Joe, you can get into it a little bit, but the police or the law enforcement on this, I, I can't say it's police misconduct, but it sure isn't kosher deal. What, what they, they, they let him, you know, you hate to go police misconduct, but uh, let's just put it this way. <laughs> if he had been any other human being on this planet, he would have been arrested after the second murder. Yeah. <laughs> right. He was going riding with police officers on stolen equipment. Yeah. He was comfortable nobody was going to question him he had stored a stolen bike in his uncle's garage yes the same uh, garage attached to the house where karen subinam was killed yes um right. he, he, there there was um in a different world which i think exists now or i like to hope it exists um there would have been ramifications for the ignorance surrounding this case yeah but I do believe Light got promoted. So he did. That's what I was just going to say. Is God bless him in July of 1969, which is the month that Karen Sue Bynum disappears and was killed in his basement. Mm-hmm. He gets promoted to sergeant. Yeah. And Joe has said he would have been in the uppermost region of the UP, farthest out, probably yes. where nobody but dogs and snow is. He would be supervising himself, <laughs> an outpost of one. <laughs> right. But he was not. He was promoted. So, um, so they, they identify the motorcycle and then they I go. I want to stop you there because it's a cultural thing. But at the moment, I've read a bunch of books and a bunch of articles and everybody was comfortable. That guy got from me. Yeah. I'm like, is anybody else here thinking? He would have been in Siberia. Okay. Outpost line. Yeah. Even 1969. He would in, yeah. Yeah. I, I believe that. Just no, he was threaded through the investigation. He 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 should have been uh, a Chinese wall should have been around him as far as him and the investigation. I mean, yes, I don't he know. Should have never, I mean, he went back into his own basement to look for stuff. Yeah. With, with for the crime scene tech, supposedly. Right? Yes, allegedly. I I mean it was it is a it is a travesty. I'm gonna be honest with you. And I stand by what I said, and you know, you go back to some of these other episodes, especially for those people that have been watching us every time. Yeah. Um Second murder should have, he told everybody what happened. Yeah. He had knowledge that only the killers could know. Yeah. What does he call that a clue? Go ahead. Yeah, there are clues out there, but they were ignored. So they identify the motorcycle. They identify, then they put on the people from the, the women from the chocolate fat. Um, Rig. The wig and chocolate. There was a chocolate place next door that had a couple of witnesses that went yes, out and saw yes. him. And then there was the wig shop people. But that's where I was heading for as far as the police misconduct is. They they were showing pictures. I mean, the, they didn't have a handle on their officers. No, I think showing pictures of just the suspect by himself was bad. <laughs> right. Again, nobody cared. They were like, ah, it happened. Right, right, but that, but that, that wouldn't have tainted it. Her there because they said they'd never identify him by a picture, but they still were shown by the police. I don't think it's a matter of was it effective. I think the problem was that it happened. Right, 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 right. So um, here, let me correct one thing. I think I said the last time that Lewis L had had a heart attack early on and he wasn't very involved. He was really involved in the trial. Okay, so he. This is um, the way that it goes down in Michigan. You know, it's interesting. It depends what you read on that one. 
Well, I mean, this is the one out of the Michigan murder book. Yeah, so. I, I, I kind of when you said that, I didn't pick up on that because I kind of had picked up on a couple of things. I read that it was like, OK, young whippersnapper. So maybe that was not true. No, it seemed like he did all of the cross-examination or the majority of it, other than the uh, scientific expert, which I'll get right. to. But he did do, um, I think he he did the opening statement and then he did um, the majority of the cross-examination of the prosecution witnesses. And in Michigan, then and now, the way that a trial goes down is you have an opening statement the prosecution puts on its witnesses, the uh once they close their proofs, motions are made, and I'll get into that because motions were made and denied in this case, no surprise. And then the uh, defense puts on their case, and then uh, the prosecution gets a rebuttal, and then there's closing statements and then jury deliberations. That's how it went down in this case. That's how it goes down in almost every case that I've been involved in, and I've tried a bunch. So, so we're in the prosecution's case in chief, which means that they're putting witnesses on uh, doing direct examination, and then the defense gets to cross-examine them. All right. So the the Lewis Sell, who's the older fifty-six-year-old that had just had the heart attack, he's doing the majority of the cross-examination, and so he tries to poke holes in the in the eyewitness testimony. All right, and Joe can tell you, and I can tell you, eyewitness testimony is fraught with inconsistencies and problems. And, and problems. Let, I mean, let me clarify. Let's stop something. <laughs> You actually remember how you feel. I know you think you, I don't remember that well. You remember how you feel. Yeah. And your, your memory of it is your memory and it is accurate. It does not, however, mean that it is accurate. Exactly. Exactly. There are different law schools that will say, hey, something's going to happen. Don't freak out while you're in law school in the, in the classroom. And two guys run in and they beat the crap out of each other. Then they run out. And then you have 50 people in the, in the classroom that cannot tell you what exactly happened. Right. Very few that, that anybody, and even when they're prompted that something's going to happen. Right? Yeah. I'll tell you the other thing too, fear and real stress does it. Um, don't want to get too lost in it. We'll maybe do a episode one time about evidence and eyewitnesses. And it's, um, it's not that people are lying. That's the problem with, with mm -hmm. people. They, they, they think people think people are lying or, They've got something wrong. It's just your memory is your memory. It's about how you are experiencing this. Right. Okay. Yeah. It is how you are experiencing this. That's what you're remembering. It's your story. Yeah. yeah. So up to, so the, the, the motorcycle was identified. They actually brought the motorcycle into the courtroom. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, that is a good trial tactic. I've brought in things, TVs and other things, and it's really good because the, the jury is damn near asleep most of the time because it's so boring the way that it's not like CSI or Law and Order. It's not, not anything like that. It's For us all, guys, it ain't no Perry Mason. <laughs> it isn't Perry Mason at all. So, so anyway, they brought the motor. So the, so the motorcycle maybe was clearly identified. Okay, I believe that there was reasonable doubt as to the motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Not it was thin, but it, but I think that there could have been reasonable doubt on that. Uh, the witness identification, they couldn't shake the people from the wig shop. The co there was inconsistencies, which there always is in, yeah. in this testimony, because, you know, you're talking a year later. You're talking about something that happens. Just you don't know that the woman's going to be killed. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but people go out and they look and they, they had, you know, one was in interested in the motorcycle. He was a good looking guy. The other one was interested in the guy. He was wearing a kind of unique shirt. Yeah. That would be so, yeah. So the eyewitness identification of John McCollins, um, ambiguous to me, but I think that they proved that it most likely was him. All right. Well, he did not help that he drove around and talked to every swinging person. That did. is true. That is true. The cumulative, I think the cumulative effect was that the jury knew or, or perceived that he drove away with her. All right. Yeah. So, so after they did that and the, the cross-examination was pretty good. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, when people believe what they believe, it isn't Perry Mason and, you know, we're older, so we know what Perry Mason is. The younger people probably don't have a clue, but um, there is no aha moment normally. 
I mean, very rarely in my career is there an aha moment. I get them, maybe two or three in my career, four maybe. And usually it's the police, and I show that they're lying. But um, it's it, and that's only because the police testify three or four times. They do a police report, they do a preliminary examination in a in a felony case. So they've told their stories three or four times, and it's almost impossible to tell the truth three or four times. Absolutely, you can't tell a lie three or four times. Yeah, unless you're changing something up. That's why you tell people to tell the truth. Because if you are, <laughs> you can't. Yeah, at right. Time you cannot remember your story. Right, right, right. So then they shift to um, the scientific evidence. But let me shift back to to the Andrew um, Manuel and the Arnie Davis thing, because this is the timeline. OK, she disappears around 12, 15, 12, 30 with a dude with a motorcycle. All right. She's found the very next day in a in a in a ditch or a culvert pitched off of the side of the road. OK, so that is. You know, say it's 12 hours, 13 hours, whatever it is between them. So she is somewhere for a period of time. All right. So Andrew uh, or Andrew Manuel and Arnie Davis both testified that at four o'clock, John Norman Collins is at the Emmett Street house. Okay. So this is my thesis, and it's only a thesis. And Joe, you can you know, comment on it is that John or McCollins abducted John or McCollins abducted Karen, uh, Karen Sue Bynuman, took him to his uncle's house, bound her. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then left her there. That's the only way the timeline makes sense. Yeah. It's the only so way he, he leaves her there because, okay. And we haven't gotten to the defense's case yet, but they, he tries to do an alibi that he is at this motorcycle shop at 1.15, 1 2 o'clock. All right. Which, if he got her to his uncle's house and bound, bound her up, he definitely could have been in that motorcycle shop and then been back at the, if you believe, Arnold Davis, who has proven that he took that trailer to California with John Norman Collins as a criminal act, proven he was part of a burglary ring with John Norman Collins who's breaking and entering houses, which is one step away from, uh, if not violent crime. Yes. Murder. Is that which one was that again? Andrew Manuel. Yeah, Manuel. Okay, I want to make clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the one that went to California. Yeah. Got that. Okay. So there's scuff marks in the kitchen at the like house. Okay. She's bound for a period of time, not found for ten, ten, at least 10 hours. Mm-hmm. All right. So my thesis, it's not a logical leap, right? That John R. McCollins either let them know that she was there where they came over. Oh, John Norman Collins had lost a key to that house and Mr. Light gave him another key. So John Norman Collins had at least one key, if not two. Right. To that house. All right. And then, um, so we're still on the, I just wanted to throw that in there before we get to the cross-examination side of life, but I didn't know that. I didn't catch that because the, the book's, that we have are using not the real party's names. And until we went through these 12 episodes, I did not put them, put it together. Yeah. It took a while for me too to realize he's had to just keep her there. Cause otherwise this timeline is way close. Yeah. I mean, yeah. razor thin close. Right. Right. So I just wanted to throw that in there cause they testified that they actually go out to dinner later. Mm-hmm. All right. And then John Norman Collins, does something and comes back at one thirty. But I mean, they could have testified, you know, mm. the police did not go hard after Arnie Davis or An- uh, Andrew Manuel. That's what it's I the understatement told. of a lifetime. <laughs> right. They did not go after him at all. Yeah, yeah. And they really didn't help the case for the, to, for the conviction. Cause which, when we get to the, which I'm getting ready to get to is the scientific evidence. The hair evidence pretty much convicted. Yeah, I agree with that. But I want to say this. This is so everybody can kind of get this because we're 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 on sacred ground here because 
we do not have any of the original documents. We are going by people's writing. Some of it's good, some of it's okay, some of it's bad. Not so good, right? Okay. That timeline on killing her is tight, tight, tight. Yeah. Maybe impossible unless he leaves her there and goes back and finishes the job. Yeah. Yep. And yet it's daytime and nobody sees anything. There's yeah. nobody sees her take her in the house and nobody yeah. sees him remove her from the house. All right. None. And remember, he's on a motorcycle. He can get her there, but I don't know about taking a dead I'm body out. I'm not sure you take a body out. There you go. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know whether Lewis Cell was at his top of his game because he just had the heart attack. I mean, he was – what I, we didn't mention before was he was known as a mob lawyer. He was a mob lawyer, which is to not be confused with a homicidal serial killer. <laughs> right. But he had right. represented some top, top organized crime figures in Detroit and been very successful at it, evidently. Yeah. This may have been a little bit different, though, because they didn't drive around on a motorcycle in a very easy to describe shirt. True that. And dead people show up there on the back True of the that. So the scientific evidence um, first was blood. Okay, so there was blood found on the floor in the basement and then on, uh, I think, a work shirt or blouse of, of Miss Like. And it was typed out as type A, which I didn't know myself about that there are three types of type A blood and there was some other sub ways that you could have determined. Mm -hmm. And Lewis Cell kind of beat him up on that. And I think he scored some points on that as mm -hmm. far as the blood goes. Mm -hmm. um, but Blood in the basement, mm, on a blouse, mm, unexplained. I mean, the jury has to be thinking, all right, because remember back to no killings since John McCollum was arrested. Right? <laughs> That's that rock in the shoe, right? Yeah. So then they get to the hair evidence, and I think we mentioned in the last episode or maybe one of the other ones that um, in the vaginal vault, there was a, her panties evidently, and it had a whole bunch of fine clippings on it. And they were similar to fine clippings. If you remember, Miss Like used to cut the three boys and Mr. Like's hair right. in the basement with clippers. Okay. And, and these were fine clippings. Um, so, and, uh, and the pictures that I've seen, Corporal, newly promoted to Sergeant Like, mm. wore like a Marine close cut cut like I think most of the um, Michigan State Police still wear. Yeah, they're tight. They're tight. High and tight is what they call it in the military. And I believe the boys did. I know my father cut my hair high and tight. Yes, yes. I, they did mine until I said no. Yeah, I said the same thing. I used to cry when they they're cut mine. But anyway, so in the direct testimony, um, it was, of course, clearly the likes hair, right? Yeah. That was taken off of the panties. All right. So that's kind of the way it ends. They, the prosecutor, they, uh, they cross examined them. They got, they made some points. They scored some points um, as far as the ambiguity of it and that, that they had never used. They had only used it one time, actually, in the state of Michigan prior. Yeah. That was a Canadian case. And actually, it, that, they use some nuclear, some kind of test that they were uh, determine the different components of the hair in order to to match it. And um, the pro the uh, defense made some some points that they maybe neutralized it. That's what my goal as a defense attorney, as I said the last time, is to really flip it on, on its head and use it against the prosecution. Right. If, if at the best you can do sometimes is just neutralize. I'm not sure they right. did really, but so they came out of the, so the, the state closes its case um, in chief and then a bunch of motions are filed. All right. Most, mostly is to, to throw out all this so-called scientific evidence uh, and the judge. And I think rightly so is they were qualified as experts. That's just their opinion. It, and this is a term of art, um, goes to weight and credibility, and the jury can weigh that. Can they? 
Yeah, I'm not sure about I'll that. I'll tell you this. He was guilty at that point when he said <laughs> Right, right, right. I so, am sure if, if it was whack and doodle and they could have got rid of it, they would have done that. But yeah, right, 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 right. Uh, yeah. So then the, um, the the defense gets to put on their uh, defense. All right. So they get their case in chief, basically. And so mm-hmm. the defense puts on uh, three or four people out of the uh, motorcycle shop that John Arma Collins went to to pay a bill that um, he could have paid the day before, but he didn't evidently have the cash. Mm-hmm. Seems a little suspect to me, but, you know. We're going to pay the day after because it was already late, you know. Yeah, and then he proceeds to talk to every person in that place, probably. And hey, and look at me! Can, do you remember my name? Right, and nobody can remember exactly when he was there. It, right. you no, know, it was from twelve to two thirty ish. Yeah, uh, you, you know, know but, here's what was interesting in one of the books. They they made a big deal out of that. That you know, it's like they couldn't tell what time it was. I don't know what time it is right now. <laughs> Nor do I. I mean, I have to check it. Okay. Yeah. Um, one man's twelve fifteen is another man's twelve ten. Right. Look, I think one of the things too, just this campers. Let me let me tell you this because in the book, I, I I was like, whoever wrote this book, because I'm trying to remember which one it was was my age, so they should have known this. If there were five clocks in that shop, there were five different times on it. Exactly, exactly. For those of you that have lived on digital time. Mm-hmm. Where everything in your house is within 30 seconds. Like, <laughs> that is a new phenomenon. Yeah. You could have been in a building with five clocks and had five different times. That is true. Okay. And I don't mean one minute off either. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So there you go. So the alibi witnesses, I mean, it didn't really get them anything. I mean, the timeline was tight, as Joe said, and it remained tight. Uh, and then they put on their counter scientific evidence. All right. And they get the Mac daddy dude who evidently invented this, mm-hmm. the scientist who invented this uh, typing, hair, hair follicle typing stuff. And um, they poked holes a little bit in the, um, scientific evidence that was put on in direct, not much because this guy, he hadn't really tested anything since 1964. So five years before. And it's science a long time. Yeah. He hadn't done, he hadn't really tested it, but he created the actual uh, procedure that, that, that worked. All right. And he said some things and, you know, they, they poked around the soft underbelly to say that the scientific evidence wasn't done right. That, that this, that the, the plating that it was put on two glass, dry glass things to put under the microscope and why, cause you can't see. And they were talking about the adjustment of the stereo uh, microscope that you couldn't see it. It was big foggy or blurred. And they, in the uh, cross-examination, the prosecution kind of came back and made the guy look a little bit like an idiot, but not so much. And um, they, the prosecution basically, uh, neutralized it didn't quite rebut it but neutralized it. all right and then so there was a back and forth with the defense and i don't know how they knew this but they were like uh john Norman collins needs to testify and i'm always iffy on putting a criminal defendant on the stand because i know what i can do in cross-examination and i know the pro- a good prosecutor can do the same um bad prosecutor yeah. Yeah. They can, they twist you up in a knot. And if the, if, if a wrong question is asked, and this is right, this was in a lot of the books. If the wrong question is asked, you open up the door right. to other things. Cause they were talking about character evidence. Well, they got women who said that he raped them. And yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a, yeah, he's a uh, character. Right. They were talking about putting a sister up there, you know, a, a, a nun up there about how good he was and, so then Fank, Neil Fank, the uh, Aunt Louis Selbert, the other one said, well, uh, John, do you want to testify? He said, yeah, I want to testify. He says, well, do you think you can handle a brutal cross-examination? He said, yeah, I can handle it. So Neil Fink with Margo, somebody in the room, I think was uh, Neil Fink's uh, assistant, 
he starts to brutalize John Herman Collins and he calls his mother a whore and that he beat the crap out of his sister and his wife, his mother's a pig. And John Herman Collins uh, says, I'm going to punch you in the face or something like that. So he proved that John Herman Collins could not take a, a brutal cross-examination, which it was a brutal cross-examination. And it but, should be because he is probably violent. Yeah, right, exactly. Here's the difference between me and them. I would have already known that. Yeah. He, there's a possibility he killed at least eight people. The question is, is that's attorney-client privilege stuff, so I don't know who's talking out of school, but uh, that made it into at least one book, if not yeah. all of them. Yeah. I would have so, just said, uh, you're never getting up there. Yeah. Because all so you have to do is say one stupid thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But sometimes you have to, I mean, especially in he said, she said, and this isn't a he said, she said. No, this is not a he said, she said. This is not that. Yeah. yeah. This was so a, was, you killed a bunch of people, said. Yeah. Okay. So they, um, they re- the, the defense rested, and that was their last. Uh, As a matter of fact, I would be honest with you, I would have tried to diminish his size. He wouldn't have stood up a lot. Yeah. Because he's a big fella. Because you don't want people, look, rather you know it, you judge everybody by their appearance. Yeah. I know you're not supposed to say that, but you do. Everybody does. And you don't want, I would have not wanted him walking around. I would have not wanted him to be involved in anything where he was making a lot of contact because he's a huge person. Because I would not want 12 people going, oh, yeah, this guy could have thrown her down a ravine. He's huge. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. That's another reason not to let him get up there and be big and burly and angry. Yeah. So they they rest their case. They do not put John Norman Collins on the stand. And I don't think it would have helped them, but it wouldn't have hurt him because he spent the rest of his life in jail. So, you, know, yeah. uh, you know, that's always, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking. But so I wouldn't have done it. I'd have rolled it yeah. up. So after the Defense closes its case. The prosecution gets to rebut. Okay. And that this is what I, I always say in the very beginning, but um, when I'm talking to the jury about how it goes down and that they, that they get the last word. Okay. Well, they get the last evidence and then they also get the last word. And, I, and I'll explain that too. But so they get to rebut them. So Booker Williams, remember the, the guy whose wife had the aneurysm and died? Mm-hmm. He's back in the game, all right? And the book, at least Michigan Murder Book, said he was stalking like a Cheshire cat. He puts his expert back up on the stand for the scientific evidence, all right? Mm-hmm. And um, all of the stuff that, that their witness said, he rebutted and then made him look like an idiot. Yeah. I mean, he made him look like a true idiot. And some of the things that they had asked, uh, this guy rebutted and Lewis Sell even said, Oh, I missed that. He said that on the record or something yeah. like that. And it, it sucked the oxygen out of the room for the defense because up to that point, at least the guy who wrote the Michigan murder book thought that there was reasonable doubt that he was a guy who even put her in that basement. Right. right. But then after after this, uh, there was little doubt, though it took the jury a while to to uh, yeah. to deliver. There was no hope there. I yeah. I also with me reading it, I, I will be honest with you. I I kind of thought there was a totality there. Yeah, there always I, I, is. Huh? There's always that is that's what I argue in defense, and the prosecution argues. That you say, hey, yeah, look. Some of our evidence is a little shaky, but you take the totality of circumstances and, and there's no doubt, right? Yeah, that's, that's, I think that's what I, I will tell you to this day. I think two things put him in the guilty chair. Um, one is this hair evidence. I think rather or not, if you looked at it by today's standard, that that would have been good or not. That's up to debate. Mm-hmm. Him driving around in a very flashy motorcycle in a very flashy shirt while you're a huge, good-looking dude and everybody notices you and you talk to everybody. I, 
I don't think he could climb out of those two things. One of them actually would have been bad enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you my personal opinion about this trial. And I'm um, after reading several books, but the Michigan Burger book was really good. And not that the other ones weren't, but I'm, I'm mm. going to tell you what I thought. He is so brazing. This is just my opinion, by the way. Yeah. He is so brazing that day. He's almost daring people to catch him. He literally sits on the corner and lets them come out and look at him. Yeah. He is not a nondescript guy that people will not remember. Yeah. Well, and remember, this is the, the seventh murder in the Ann Arbor yeah. Atlantic area that has occurred in the last two years. Yeah. We believe two others, probably a lot more, but. Yeah, which you'll see in next week's end. And, and he had gotten away with every single one. I mean, yeah. definitely, we keep saying the second murder he should have been. Yeah, made no doubt. He is as brazen as can go. Now, could you have climbed out of that without the hairs? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe the hairs could you have climbed out of there? You know, you get into a lot of science. Nobody said those hairs are those kids. Yeah, right. No, nobody said that, by the way. Right. There was just, it was probably good representation. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And this is the thing that we always, and, and Joe, I don't know whether you, you being on the side of the law enforcement knows or cares, but whenever you're cross examining, a expert witness, you have to be really careful because I don't ask a lot of questions because I don't know the answers to it. I am not the expert. No. So it is very easy for the expert to tie me in a knot. So no. No, unless no. I've got a smoking gun, I get in and out on my cross examination. Yeah, I, I think that is what most people do. That's why experts have a gigantic advantage. They do. Because um, you don't want to ask questions. This is a life lesson. Life mm. lesson. Don't ask questions you don't want to know the answer to. And don't ask questions you don't know the answer to. Yeah. And make no doubt, a cop is an expert. He is testif He is an expert freaking testifier. That's mm -hmm. what he does. All right. Other than his law enforcement job. Yeah. He is a professional witness for yeah. the state. Yeah, and especially a guy that does a lot. They are definitely, by the time you get him into detective, they really are. But I will tell you this. Um, I'm not sure that the hair evidence was everything that they made it sound, because I, I still get a little confused on that. I'm going to be honest with you mm -hmm. and stuff. But I think if there was anybody doubting it, him riding his motorcycle around just was... No ifs, ands, or buts. And he's the only guy that could have got into the likes basement. So it's just, I think it was just the totality of everything. Yeah. Let me say this about scientific evidence. Okay. When, when people, when words, scientific evidence comes out of somebody's mouth, you've got to be very, very, very careful because as we see, not going to get into it because we'll get, freaking put in YouTube jail again, but the science that's out there, when they say it's science, it's not. It's pseudoscience at best, right? Yeah, there's a lot of that. And that's what this hair evidence was, because Joe and I have said it from the beginning. Yeah, I don't think there's much doubt that this guy killed this gal, but the scientific, them calling that scientific evidence, yeah. hmm, not sure about that, because usually at least when I was taught in grade school, what the scientific method was is that you come up with a hypothesis and then you do tests to, to test that hypothesis. And then you come up with some kind of result and maybe you do some Kentucky windage and you change what your hypothesis is based on your testing. I've never heard of any people who get up and say it's science that that's what they do. All right. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm very uncomfortable with it too. And I, <laughs> right. you know, once this kind of moves and we do a couple of things, we're going to revisit Gary's case and you'll see exactly what we're talking about, but we don't want to go right. there quite yet. Right. Well, you know, Joe and I, we were in the days of Bunsen burners and uh, yeah. asbestos in our, in our science classes. And that's yeah. the way they taught us the scientific method though. I have had numerous, numerous uh, police officers, especially related to arson don't have a clue. I say, so what's the scientific method? They can't even recite it to me, just like I just did. 
And I probably said I have wrong. But. No, it's the truth. And uh, yeah, science, sometimes, and here's the other thing, science is intimidating. You'll say, I got the science. And some people are like, oh, not me. I can't question. Well, I use this and I stole it out of a, uh, what I call the Bible for drunk driving, but the uh, there's a breathalyzer, okay, and, and it is flawed in many, many ways. All right, but it's all we got, right? Yeah. So, but people think that you blow in it and ding, like a toaster yeah. comes out, says what your what your breath uh, blood alcohol content is. Well, there's many variables that depend on that: your temperature, your body temperature, how much you blow, whether you burp or, yeah. or regurgitate alcohol in the back of your mouth, whether you. I had one guy who did Listerine in his mouth right when the cop was sitting there. Yeah. Behind him. Yeah. There's just, I don't know if you know, but Listerine is, is a methanol alcohol, a lot of it. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's just crazy. Everything, but it's, <laughs> that's the problem is we say it's science and then it's kind of science. Yeah. So it's the best, to, you know, it's the best science we have, you know, it's like, you know, when they used to come over to your house and you know, back out, couple hundred years ago and attached those leeches to you. That was, <laughs> right. science. That was science. It was science, man. Yeah. Here's some science. And they put the leeches all over you. And that was it. Right. Right. So right. Don't question me. I'm a doctor. This is science. And they got leeches all over you. Yeah. Science so, is whatever you want it to be right now. Yeah. Right. So this is no spoiler alert, but, you know, John Norman Collins, after a deliberation, and they deliberated a good amount of time. See, they didn't for Gary Leiterman. They did 23 hours or whatever it was. But at least they went over the weekend. And uh, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. They they came back with guilty. So yeah, there was no spoiler alert there. He was guilty. And in Michigan um, and the, 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 the defense tried to slip in their second degree murder, which they should have done earlier yeah. to give the. Um, to give the jury a, an option because I did it in another case that of mine where they were, he was charged with a higher offense and I wanted a lesser included mm -hmm. so that the jury had an option. Cause they go, hmm, he did something, but he didn't do that. What he's charged with, yeah. but they found him guilty of first degree murder, which in Michigan is a life offense with no opportunity of parole. Right. And as we speak, he is still in there, right? He is in Ionia. I believe they moved him. He was in Marquette and he is now, He's in his mid seventies, I think, and he is in <clears throat> the Ionia prison. And uh, we we're trying to talk to him, but he's not talking to us. You're talking to us. There you go. Right. We try. And so that is kind of the conclusion, as far as you got anything else on this, Joe? No, I think we've done enough here, and I think we've also covered this. And I'm, it's going to get interesting next episode because you're going to see that there's a lot of thought that he did a lot. Yeah, we have that. That's the next episode will be the my interview with Larry Matthewson, who is the MU mm -hmm. campus policeman. And then we're going to take a break from the Michigan murders, but we are going to circle back in some near future to to do a roundup or whatever with uh, with Gary Earl Leiterman, who was convicted of a second offense, second uh, alleged victim in this case. The third, isn't it? Mixer is the third. Uh, mixer, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. So we'll do that. Yes. So there you go. This is kind of the final up on there. He was found guilty. We'll finish it up next week. For those of y'all, please hit subscribe, like the video, make a comment. We appreciate all you can do for us. We do. We do. And if you can, you know, volunteer a few bucks, we'll handle that. There'll be a link down there for that too. Always. Okay. So look, we appreciate you sticking around. We'll finish up next week. Um, it's been very, very interesting. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed being able to do it. So we thank you. So if there's nothing else left to say. I'll say see you. But what I was going to say is we are going to pivot here pretty soon to the real true crime where we're going to get into some different things, the Manson murder and other things. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's other crime out there. And we're going to do a little bit there's more, of some quicker overviews, and especially some stuff where we think everybody's wrong. Yep. There you go. I went in, especially in places where you think what you've been told is not right. That is true. We'll go there. So until next time, y'all guys take it easy and see you. <laughs>